so although frightened, Megan is putting on a brave face. I found it to be very difficult, but in the long run, I knew that I, I can do it, and it's, it's all for the better for everybody. I mean, my family and the next and I my father. I think that's it. Okay. And as quickly as he can. But it seems that was the easy part. Tests get more intense as Andy's brain is wired up to a magnetoencephalography scanner, or MEG. Escalator. Dark. The MEG records brain activity by picking up magnetic fields generated by our nerve cells. Cactus. Megan is preparing for an EEG. Electrodes glued to her head monitor her brain waves. He will, actually. With each test, the children are becoming increasingly nervous that an abnormality will appear. But at any point, the hospital chaperone again. sees Megan is not comfortable. So if you really don't want to do it, I'm not going to twist your arm. I'm just on emotional overload right now. Um, Megan bravely tries to keep going with the test. You're halfway done, Megan. But by now, she's in obvious distress. Dr. Geshwind is alerted. He asks the camera crew to step out of the room. After talking with Megan, he calls a halt to the EEG exam. It's all proving tougher than Megan expected. Even though they're very young, maybe we will find something that's not normal. The thought of that is very emotionally charged uh, for, for them. I thought that I was mentally prepared to deal with all this. I couldn't wait to get out here. And when I got you know, in the hospital, things changed rapidly for me and found that I wasn't aware, I guess, how deep things would, would hit me. Andy, too, is losing his resolve. He's a pretty quiet, private person. He doesn't share his thoughts a lot. So this has been difficult for him. So um, I'm here to do some cognitive testing. And I uh, just wanted to touch base with you about how the day's going. I think I'm, I'm pretty exhausted right now. I think I'd actually rather either do it tomorrow or just take a pass on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I really just need a good night's sleep right now. I can understand that. Megan and Andy probably yeah. didn't realize all that it was going to take and all that it was going to bring out for them to kind of relive things and, and think about it and then think about themselves and possibly, you know, their future. In tackling the family disease head on, Andy and Megan face difficult choices, as other patients of Dr. Geshwind have before them. Touch your chin, and then my finger. Good. How about the other arm? Touch in June 2005, Dr. Geshwind received a referral from the state of Utah. Diane Stroiling had rapid dementia. The doctors back home suspected CJD, but her symptoms didn't quite match the diagnosis. Read these words for me. Mama. Tip. When we examined her, her thinking was relatively spared. Prion disease was certainly in the differential. However, in her case, the MRI did not show the typical changes that we've recently seen in patients with sporadic Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, or CJD. Diane Stroiling lived in the town of Provo in Utah. She was in the prime of life when suddenly struck down by a mystery illness. I remember her walking down the halls and having to balance, hold onto the walls to balance. And at that point, she was having some trouble with her memory. The doctors were baffled. None of the treatments they gave Diane slowed her decline. visit grandma we would make cookies together and as her illness progressed I noticed that she had a more difficult time each time we went it was more difficult for her to manipulate her hands but we still had fun together Diane remained positive throughout her illness 
but her body could not resist the disease. You see them wanting to try so hard, you know, but their body won't let them. You know, first uh, balance, then uh, the ability to walk, then uh, the ability to uh, uh, swallow and speak. And when you think about how vivacious she was and uh, what she ended up to be, that's the sad part of this disease. On July the 30th, 2005, just two hours after her daughter Jennifer gave birth to her third child, Devon, Diane died. I told uh, Diane that Devon was here and that he was healthy and that Jennifer was doing fine and that if she wanted to, she could go now. Diane's body was sent for autopsy. Her doctors had been baffled by the illness that took her life. By chance, her post-mortem was conducted by an expert in rare neurological disorders. To our surprise, when we examined the microscopic sections of her brain, and in particular, the thalamus, we noticed that there was a remarkable loss of neuronal cells. This was a classic sign of fatal insomnia. But the disease is not always genetic. There is also a non-genetic form. When Dr. Chin reported back to Diane's family, he didn't know which form she had had. He said that she had died of an illness called fatal insomnia, and that there was a genetic form and a sporadic form. And as soon as he said genetic, of course, I became quite concerned, having seen what my mom had gone through and worrying about um, having that happen to me and the possibility of that happening to my Look at that big one. Sporadic fatal insomnia occurs randomly. Nobody knows how its victims contracted, but it's far rarer than even the genetic familial form. Let, watch what Grandpa's going to do, and then you have to do the same thing, see? Okay, put, it, put, it, put your hand flat. A gene test on Diane's mother would show whether the disease was the genetic form. But could Jennifer bear to find out? When you were smaller, you were a little bit afraid of doing that. Just... In San Francisco, Andy and Megan White also have the chance to learn if they carry the fatal insomnia gene. They know it's likely that at least one of them does. After five hours of medical scrutiny at the University of California hospital, they meet the genetic counselor, whose job is to make them fully aware of the implications of taking the gene test. First, what I would like to do is to take a full family history. Recounting the family history is painful. One of the uncles that died in his 40s, he had two children that both died from that. And how old were they? 26. Both? The male. The male. And were there any other health issues besides the FFI? Oh, yes. yes. He had cerebral palsy. Megan and Andy are now in their 20s, as their cousin was when he got fatal insomnia. Um, and the early ones tend to have other issues. You know, not always, but they tend to have other issues. Um, I know this is really hard. Well, and Megan um, has juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. Okay. And Not so the I'm... same kind of issue. Okay. Okay. So that's. Yeah. Can I just step over for a minute? Next, Jill Goldman turned to the question of gene testing. Her prognosis was unambiguous. There is a. 50-50 um, risk of inheriting the disease gene or of inheriting the normal gene, okay? And it literally is a flip of the coin. You could both not have it, okay? Or as in your grandmother's generation, you know, you could both have it. The only way we can figure this out is by you know, taking blood and sequencing the gene so this kind of inheritance... Megan and Andy have a serious dilemma. Should they take the blood test that will reveal their 